the public policy people being here today. We start this second session of discussion uh, related to the European uh, Media Freedom Act, market regulation and uh, journalism protection. Uh, this panel will try to uh, help all of us understand uh, how this new uh, plan regulation, which is uh, an ongoing discussion at this moment at the uh, the European uh, level will impact the, the future work of journalists uh, in, European, uh, in the European Union. Um, the declared goal of the European Media Freedom Act is to harmonize uh, the me European media landscape by addressing the differences at uh, national level on key issues that have a strong impact on the practice of journalism, freedom of information, and the formation of public opinion. The key topics addressed by the regulations are transparency of the funding of public, public media services, media capture by political forces, media ownership concentrations, the protection of sources and confidentiality, and audiences management. Grounded in the relationship between healthy media and a thriving internal European market, the regulation clearly goes beyond purely economic provisions, and by doing so, touches some of the raw norms of our society. Some historical struggles of journalism finally found a precious acknowledgement in the European Media Freedom Act, for instance, the necessary empowerment of journalism in its transnational dimension, something that uh, at OBCT we did uh, very, very precious since uh, the creation of the thing that two decades ago. Also, the recognition of freelancers as fully entitled of the same rights of professional journalists, with a little reminder here that there is no real exercise of professional rights without fair economic treatment. What's another key topic is the emergence of new technologies and their abuses that are threatening journalism safety and its core functions. The more we work on the regulation and the more we realize that nested within it, there are issues that are fundamental both for the future of the European project and the contemporary democracies worldwide. For instance, the relationship between national and supranational institutions, the relationship between journalism and the free market, or journalism and the institutional level, how journalism is perceived on behalf of uh, institutions and, and states, for instance. And also recurring wars that we became familiar with, national security, terrorism, and their complex and often contested definitions. Not all the challenges were addressed as we hoped, and the European Media Freedom Act leaves a clear bittersweet flavor in our tongues. Here with us today, we have a wonderful group of people that will help us navigate through the most important aspects of our regulation that represents a landmark in the history of the European community. We have uh, Oliver Monikare as moderator, head of the European Advocacy at the International Press Institute. We have Renat Schroeder, Director of the European Federation of Journalists. We have Elda Broaji, Professor at the European University Institute and Scientific Coordinator at the Center for Media Pluralism and Media Freedom. And we have Dimitri De Giovannes, Greek journalist with a long expertise also in the Italian context. And connected remotely, unfortunately, um, due to a last minute uh, issue. We have Gianluca Madori, which is Councillor at the Italian Order of Journalists. So I will give the floor to, and Eva Simon, sorry, you were first in the list and then SDG, sorry. And we have Eva Simon from the Liberties. Um, I will give the floor to Oliver, which will moderate uh, this debate. And thanks to all of you for being here. Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much, Dimitri. Um, 
Well, thank you, everyone, for coming along today. It's great to see so many of you. Um, and thank you to this panel of, of experts, some of whom I, I, I know or have got to know uh, very well over the last couple of years because we've been working so hard on um, advocating for what we think is the best um, the European Union the Commission to come up with for this um, Media Freedom Act. Um, it's been quite a, uh, quite a challenge um, to get into this. When we start, when we were quite astonished when the European Commission first announced that they were going to, um, to, to push ahead with the European Media Freedom Act. We've been um, advocating for some four or five years about the problems of, of media capture, essentially, essentially to Europe. Um, and you know, whether are talking about the situation in Hungary or the situation in Poland or the of the price of PC in, in, in some of the other countries, the European Commission always said, well, we don't have the tools to deal with media filters, we don't have the tools to deal with the use you know, of state advertising and, and the, 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 the way that's um, distributed distri away from the end of the media to support all that. We don't have the tools to deal with uh, when, the when public broadcasters uh, are being independent public broadcasters are being, are being compromised. Um, so, the, so we hope that the meeting is an effort to produce those tools to the Commission of the European Union more broadly to address some, some of these um, crucial issues. Um, before going further, I just a couple, couple of quick comments. Um, you will note that this, this panel is not exclusively about Italy and Southeast Europe. Um, we have speakers from Central Europe and from Northern Europe. And I think um, we cannot really understand the Media Freedom Act without understanding um, the crisis of media capture, particularly the model that was created in, in Hungary and how that has spread in these other countries. Um, I hope that during the course of this discussion, we will try always to come back to bring it down to what the system and how this affects journalism in Italy. And for that, I really want your involvement. And the normal practice is for us to do, to do a round of all the presentations, but then the second round of presentations, but then maybe up questions right to the end. Don't hesitate. If this is quite a technical discussion because we are sometimes we are too much experts we get too much into the detail but if you want to find a clarification if you want to question something about what many many issues that we've been trying to uh, um, uh, try to draw out don't hesitate to put your hand up not for a speech <laughs> but just for a question so please do that during the course of the next hour and a half maybe an hour and 20 minutes to have there um listen i, I think that's, that's enough for me. We've got lots of time to cover. I'd like to turn first of all to Renata Trelluta, a colleague of mine for some 20 plus years, but I, I won't count on exactly how many times we've known each other. We know we've been working the same on this stage, but I think Renata, as a director of the European Federation of Journalists, is probably the best place for all the panelists to give us an overview about why the Commission came up with this, what their expectations were. What the rhetoric was, because the rhetoric is about we are going to this this act is going to solve all of our problems, and what the gap is between that rhetoric and the actual detail that the position, the current position in the European Parliament and the European Council, and, and does that meet the rhetoric? But perhaps I need to to announce them, please. Thank you, Oliver, for this kind introduction. Just to say uh, two words about the organization I'm representing. The European Federation of Journalists is the umbrella organization of actually all unions and associations who are members of Council of Europe, including the FNSC in Italy. Um, and indeed, we have all been working not only two years, but much more to get something done in media freedom areas. I have been in the business for 30 years now. I started when we tried to get a green paper or legislation on media concentration. We went actually in the European Parliament quite far, but in the end it was blocked by member states from Italy, um, UK at the time in Germany. Normal, you may remember, he's still there. 
and who were murdered in the operation from, from Germany. So first of all, I want to say that um, we hope, we are not there yet, that this European Media Freedom Act will appear and it will be worth its name, as, as you say, because now we are starting tri negotiations. I will talk a little bit as to what the Parliament did, what the Council did. Now, tripartite negotiations are starting in time. There's a lot of pressure to get it done, even under this presidency, which is under the Spanish. We don't think so, because there are very different views about it, but we want and need to get it done within this European condition before the elections next year. Because after the elections, there will be a new commission, there will be Hungary presiding, and we think we may never see anything which is the worst its name. So bear with me for five minutes and um, support our course. <laughs> Um, so, yes, the European Commission finally, maybe to learn, late, I hope not, realized that so much, too much is at stake. On the one hand, the threats to media pluralism and media freedom having a potentially devastating impact on democracy, we have discussed it in the warning session. SLED, I think, has been a, a good way um, to show how much is at stake and by being commissioning us with something on SNAP. We are not happy with it. Uh, as you rightly said, it, it's an important symbol as well. The rule of law and eventually, as you also said, European integration. It's disinformation on the rise, we know it these days specifically, and independent media losing its business model and attention going to more unreliable social media, and on the other hand, threats to fair competition of independent media competing with state captured media, obscure state advertising, and no transparency of ownership. That's why, in the end, the Commission used the legal basis of competition, maybe Elder will explain more. These worrying trends have been documented, and yes, that the European Commission, and more specifically, the Media Pluralism Monitor, which has been published since 2013-14, giving an excellent analysis of the risks to core media values. The Florence Center for Media Pluralism and Media Freedom, responsible for the monitoring, and again, happy to have Elda here at our panel, rightly concluded that times were ripe to give the European Union new tools to protect and foster journalism as a public good in a digital environment. So the EMFA, and Dimitri already alluded to it, proposes a new set of rules to promote media pluralism, transparency, and independence across the EU. It is based on the audiovisual media service directives, but extends the scope to the publishing and online media service providers. That's why many publishers are not happy about it. Proposed regulation includes, as we said, safeguards against political interference in editorial decisions, something journalists feel now day by day, and surveillance of journalists. It puts a premium on the independence and stable funding of public service media, specifically important um, in Italy, but in many other countries as well, and on the transparency of media ownership and allocation of state advertisement, I think Eva will talk a little bit more about. It also sets up measures to protect the independence of journalists and disclose conflict of interests. Finally, the Act will create a new independent European board for media services composed of national media authorities. Unfortunately, not all independent, but one of the here also is to make them more independent and based on the work of the so-called European Regulative Group of Audiovisual Media Services, which was established to implement the Audiovisual Media Service Directive. Make sure the implementation is done. We, and this is not only the EFJ, but as Olga mentioned, a big group of media 
freedom, digital rights, and civil society groups have welcomed the draft of the European Commission last September as an important political symbol, but all agree that it is not ambitious enough. Many publishers group, as I said, have engaged in aggressive lobbying against the EMPA. They call the Media Freedom Act actually an Unmedia Freedom Act, being afraid that the EU Brussels would have an influence on content, which by no means was the idea of the European Commission. Attempts by German members of the European Parliament, the rapporteur of the leading committee on culture and education, Sabine Fahein, and her German shadow, Petra Kammer Eber, to weaken the draft regulation by transforming it into a directive, fortunately failed. And I wish to proudly say again that due to our united and assertive lobbying, we have been able to convince the European Parliament of the need for something much more robust that can make a difference, hopefully, and protect journalists from undue interference. Unfortunately, however, our dear 27 member states, this time led by France, the Council of the EU under the Swedish presidency in the first half of this year, did see a backlash on media freedom and journalist protection of sources, permitting the deployment of intrusive surveillance software against media service providers on broad national security grounds. And I think this will be our main problem we will have during the negotiations, because we know what's happening right now, national security will be misused by member states. Just think, governments are proposing to legalize spying on European journalists at the very time when the media pluralism monitor shows their extreme vulnerability in terms of digital security. Lobbying has led to a strengthened position within the European <laughs> Parliament without any national security exemption. An absolute ban on the deployment on national security on spyware and similar intrusive technologies was not possible, but there have been very important safeguards introduced by the European Parliament. So now we are fighting that the Council accept the EP position as the least denominator, because it's much better on very many articles. In this fight, we need all of them. Today we are living in times of unprecedented pressures on public interest journalism. This act will not solve all the many challenges ahead. As we heard before, precarity is a huge problem without sustainability. There is no journalism. It's not in this act. But together with other EU initiatives, it will, it would be a small and I believe very important step in the right direction if adopted the EP version. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks very much, Jonas. I mean, you've already touched on so many different issues there. We talked about the threat, the threat of competition, the threat of competition from, I guess, effectively state backed media against uh, private or independent media. Because one of the things we see in the country is how um, uh, it creates a barrier to investment in independent media because the independent media can't have access to. Say so advertising, there are other economic barriers that face against them. Who would invest in independent media if we can't turn a profit? It's a really important issue to talk about the, uh, the, the independence of the European regulators and all sorts of concerns about that, how much power to give it, how much, um, you know, for, and, and how it might then apply the power. And then, of course, it came back to the real trust and one of the really sort of sore points uh, of, of, of the access to question surveillance. And the debates around um, the national security exemption. I think we'll probably come back to, to these many more issues as, as we go along. But first, I would, next, I would like to turn to Anne. Already mentioned the incredible work that you've done in the um, Center for Tourism and Media Freedom, of course, for the past 10 years. It needs to be producing these annual reports, Europe wide and nationally, on questions of media tourism and media freedom. And that is certainly what what provided the, uh, the evidence, the very broad groundwork of evidence on which we in the Commission was able to, to make the case for a media freedom. But I'd really like if you could talk specifically. 
food that's more hand aware it's probably very difficult for AOS to do that. Uh, thank you, Oliver, and thank you for inviting me today. And, uh, and yes, a few words on uh, the organization I represent here. I uh, come from the Center for Media Pluralism and Media Freedom, as it was already said. And uh, this is a, a center that was established in 2012 at the European University Institute in Florence exactly for this after the failure of uh, the um, directive uh, the, the, the green paper after the, um, the fact that in the, the the civil society journalists the, in the european parliament were still pressing somehow the european institution in order to uh, do something for uh, media freedom and media pluralism in europe uh, while the European Union and the member states were somehow um, uh, rejecting this uh, this call, um, claiming that there was uh, no confidence for the European Union to act in this field, um, the uh, European Commission decided to uh, allocate some money to how to study uh, media pluralism and media freedom in Europe. So uh, our center was established uh, and. Uh, uh, starting from uh, 2013, exactly, we uh, piloted the, the uh, so called media uh, pluralist monitor, that is a tool that uh, comes from a previous study of uh, a consortium of universities led by the University of Open. Um, this, uh, this tool uh, aimed at uh, measuring the threats, the risks. For member states <clears throat> using the uh, indicators that uh, are quite broad to some extent starting from uh, the analysis of freedom of expression to uh, I mean, the market uh, the representation of the market to political pressures to um, representation of uh, minorities for instance in, in the media so uh, um, embracing a um, broad definition of media pluralism, mostly based on standards uh, that were developed at the level of the Council of Europe, for instance, at the level of the European Union and at the level of member states. So we try to find the, the, the common uh, principles that were um, uh, present with, that could uh, um, um, interpret the, the meaning of media pluralism in order to see how the situation, to measure how the situation was in each member state. And exactly, we found, we collected a lot of uh, evidence uh, because the project is quite huge, but I don't want to uh, I mean, stress too much what uh, the project did, but in any case, uh, uh, we came up with some results that uh, to some extent fed the European Media Freedom Act, because when I read in the Media Freedom Act Article 5 about PSM, Article 6 about transparency, Article um, the, the article about uh, specific issues we um, uh, we found relevant and, and real problem in particular in uh, uh, Eastern uh, European countries. Independence of media authorities, conflict of interest, uh, transparency of ownership, so on and so forth. Yes, we, we think that probably some uh, uh, of the uh, results of the media, the media pluralist monitors were. Um, and were uh, introduced, I mean, in some of the topics of the Media Pluralism Monitor were introduced in the European Media Freedom Act. Uh, and the Media Freedom Act, in the end, uh, uh, considers this broad definition of media pluralism that is not only concentrating on uh, the, uh, the issue of uh, concentration of, uh, of the media market. And, uh, the, the topic of the concentration of the media market indeed has been always uh, in, 
main problem when dealing with media pluralism and a main problem to justify in terms of uh, European intervention because uh, the European Union does not have a specific context on this. It has a competence on competition, uh, uh, but uh, indeed uh, the uh, realm of media pluralism was always uh, perceived as a matter of uh, uh, state interest and state competence. And I think that in this regard, probably, the European Media Freedom Act uh, offers a new perspective that, of course, is not perfect, but in my opinion, has the advantage of being European to some extent, because uh, this is not a, uh, and I mean, uh, Article 20 and 21 of um, the European Media Freedom Act, in particular, Article 21. It is uh, uh, the act provides a rule in order to uh, assess through a sort of uh, media plurality test the uh, mergers within uh, a certain member state. So, uh, what is uh, the, the more or less the, the, the procedure that uh, is uh, foreseen in, in Article 21? That uh, a, a law, an, an internal law, so to some extent, the, the competences, the national competences and the national particularities, the peculiarities are safeguarded. Uh, a national law should uh, define the standards in order to uh, um, judge, let's say, a, uh, um, a concentration, a, a merger, a media merger, uh, based on uh, standards that link to internal in external pluralism and uh, sustainability of, uh, of the media. Then the possibility, the, 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 the act uh, provides the, a sort of peer review, let's say, of a, a European uh, body, that is this European board for um, media services and of the commission in order to uh, assess uh, somehow and to uh, um, uh, give a uh, opinion on uh, the uh, merger itself. So, uh, in order to um, define somehow a sort of uh, uh, European jurisprudence on what uh, can be considered um, in, in line with media pluralism on, or not, also at national, but also at a, a European level. So there is a common effort, let's say, that the idea of Article 21 is to find a common uh, understanding of uh, uh, what, uh, uh, what is uh, uh, media plurality in terms of market concentration and uh, to um, uh, and, and to have a peer review at a European level uh, on what happens at national level. Why did I say that this is uh, a, um, something that can be done uh, using the, the added value of uh, the European law? Exactly because of that, exactly because of uh, uh, this is uh, a, a common effort. There is uh, the possibility of uh, uh, that a national decision could be challenged, say, by uh, uh, a European body. And uh, uh, it's probably less, uh, it's more difficult to uh, avoid uh, the, uh, this opinion, considering also that this is a regulation and uh, uh, must be implemented. Therefore, there is always the possibility that uh, an infringement procedure is uh, uh, opened when the, uh, the, the rule is not applied. Um, so, um, this is uh, um, an article that somehow tries to solve, uh, tries to find a solution to the long standing problem of. Uh, uh, not having a specific uh, uh, law at European level to uh, tackle ownership concentration, 
and uh, uh, that is complemented also by other rules, including the underrated Article 20, in my opinion, that uh, is uh, uh, somehow um, a, a general uh, article, an article that gives a general um, principle based on which uh, any measure that can affect the operation of the media services in the internal market should be duly justified, proportionate, reasonable, transparent. So, any kind of law that uh, um, is uh, limiting somehow the operativity of uh, media services in a member state should be uh, challenged. Uh, in order to uh, by um, the, the European uh, um, the European Media Freedom Act under the European Media Freedom Act. So um, this is uh, one uh, of the main um, areas and uh, and uh, um, uh, provisions of uh, the. European Media Freedom Act, exactly tackling the market. Um, we have to think uh, that uh, uh, this is uh, that, that the act is uh, this uh, uh, provision uh, is uh, must be seen in a general uh, framework, uh, the one of uh, the information market uh, that is currently as is currently in uh, somehow the hair strength is uh, uh, somehow facing a, a deep crisis. And uh, uh, if uh, the European Media Freedom Act has a, 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 some kind of uh, uh, motivation is exactly exist that uh, that uh, should be that is uh, uh, increasingly uh, occupied by other types of uh, information. And uh, this brings me also to remind everyone that uh, um, I mean, there is uh, this stream of the European legislation on supporting media, it's very important. There is also a stream of legislation that is already approved, uh, including the Digital Services Act, that uh, somehow creates a horizontal um, uh, benchmark, I would say, a horizontal set of rules for uh, the, the large uh, the, the online platforms, and in particular, very large online platforms uh, to. Um, deal also with uh, information and disinformation. Mm -hmm. So um, somehow the, in, under the Digital Services Act, for instance, uh, this, this famous Article 34 that allows uh, the, um, the platforms uh, to uh, assess the risks uh, Uh, that uh, uh, do a risk assessment of uh, uh, how the um, services of the online platform themselves could affect media pluralism and media freedom. So we are somehow delegating them the assessment on media freedom and media pluralism. Of course, uh, this is not just this, uh, but uh, uh, we have to take take into account that uh, this is uh, the general uh, situation today of the, the uh, information ecosystem. Uh, we have uh, the media, we, and uh, somehow the Media Freedom Act uh, helps us define the role of uh, the media in the new uh, digital economy. We have uh, uh, online platforms that uh, as well play some kind of role in defining what is the information that we receive. I stop. Thank you. No, no, that, that's very good. I, I, I'm going to come straight back to immediately because I want to. Uh, okay. Well, I'd like to. Can you explain how this would work in the talent system? So, if you have a merger, to be, we, we heard on an earlier panel about meaningful situation, would be a very big problem. Here it is. So, let's suppose 
we have an emerging two billion media company, which is like, well, I'm not an expert, so I can't name oh, an expert on Italian so I can't name who would judge that. Is there already some form of test in it? In some countries in Europe, there is a new variety test. Okay, okay. There, there is, but, um, so who would judge, assess whether or not, I assume this is going to be anti competition, or so the pro competition, the pro anti monopoly authority. Do they do a new variety test? If they then pass that, permit the merger, but there is protest against that. How does that get taken up by the board? Mm -hmm. And then eventually, what happens? I'm just very quickly because I didn't want to. Do that. Yes. yes. No, um, I uh, just want to say that, uh, I mean, while I was coming here uh, on the inside note, and forgive me, uh, I heard the news about uh, the fact that the government lowered the, the license fee for the PSM. Uh, and uh, this is not related, of course, but uh, we have a, a Article 5 that says that uh, um, the, a, a fair amount to sustain uh, of, uh, of funds in order to sustain the, the PSM should be granted. And this is something that should be explored in this sense. Uh, on the, um, and in this sense, the European PF Act at least could give some. Uh, um, protection, maybe. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, on uh, Article uh, Twenty One, um, uh, in, the, in in Italy, somehow, I don't want to say that we already have Article Twenty One implemented, but uh, uh, based on <laughs> so it's not promising. That's why I'm okay. Okay. now I say that uh, no, um, I said before that the other value is uh, the European uh, um, perspective, uh, and in this sense, I think uh, uh, it is because. Uh, um, when we uh, read Article 51 of uh, uh, our uh, USMA, that is uh, the uh, Unified Text of uh, Audiovisual Services, and I just uh, uh, we see uh, that uh, uh, the, the law uh, defines some criteria uh, based on which to assess uh, uh, concentrations in the media sector. And why is this so? It wasn't before, it was different, uh, but there was a, a, a European um, Court of Justice um, uh, ruling that uh, uh, somehow intervened within uh, the Italian law saying that uh, what it provided before, so limiting the possibility uh, for a telecommunication company to enter the, the media market if uh, it uh, was over a certain threshold uh, in, in the SIC, in the system in the government communication. Um, this ruling said that the, this rule, the, this ruling of the European uh, Court of Justice said that this rule was uh, not reasonable to some extent because uh, it went against the uh, freedom of establishment. Somehow, we, were, we have to say that uh, these uh, two rules, uh, these two norms within uh, Article, within the European Article 21 are very much inspired in our uh, to this ruling uh, you see that uh, uh, media uh, should notify concentration to AGICOM, to the communication authority, situations uh, that uh, uh, can um, um, make you presume that there is a problem for media pluralism. I assume that uh, once uh, um, uh, this uh, uh, the, the opinion on a specific on a potential uh, concentration is uh, uh, given and it goes to the European level, the the game starts. 
And uh, that's why I say that uh, it's the other problem. Thank you. And again, Mr. Hartsman, we don't know what happens next because it's not being tested out. Um, yes. So that, that, that's, that's the same. But, 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 but thank you for also mentioning the public broadcast. In fact, that is something that we want to uh, come back to later. I may ask uh, uh, Jan Luke to comment on that. Also, about the, the, uh, uh, the ability of the bus provider to be able to bring that independent public broadcast. It's interesting you talked about you being just ruling to um to pick in to the right, especially about establishing the right to conduct business. Because the uh, Renato mentioned the, the possibility of the publishing provisions with the unit they were concerned that any restrictions on their ability to buy media and to merge restriction on their ability to conduct business. And that, and that is in conflict with the rise of the public to be able to access the range, the full range of the sorts of information. And that's the kind of balance that the human has is being struggling with and will continue um, to struggle with. But, but, but on that, I'd like to turn to today's Simon, uh, now from the Liberties, your form of the So you have the most inside knowledge, I think, of the modern media capture, which is like I said at the beginning. Um, it, I think, was, was, um, what was this, what essentially drove uh, the commission to start drafting uh, the media freedom act to try to sort of have to push back against uh, against the process of media capture. So it'd be great if you could sort of build on what Elle was talking about about media pluralism, specifically about the elements about only uh, transparency of media ownership and uh, transparency about the distribution of state, funding state, and state and so on, and what we achieved and think we may have achieved uh, in, in, in the media. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me. Not that I'm so proud of being the, in, the, in the room, and that seems that Poland is getting into a better situation, uh, which is an unbelievable terrible news recently. Is a, is a, Something that good to good to hear finally. Uh, those are my answer to the mic. Okay, sure. Um, so uh, so I'm I'm not hundred percent sure whether the commission's uh, initiative was based on the experience in Hungary. And the reason is that I don't think that the very problematic countries will anyhow could be pushed back to the to, to normal city or to the rule of law era uh, through European Media Freedom Act or any other acts. So the, the issue is that there, there are um, articles in, in the European Media Freedom Act that will have a huge impact in many EU member states and in the very problematic ones, they will most probably find a way to circumvent even the mandatory rules. So in a country where there is no independent media authority exists, then the requirement to report to the national media authority or the possibility to turn to the competition authority would be still a meaningless effort and uh, overseeing uh, media market on behalf of authorities that are government captured will not really help. But the European Media Freedom Act is not something that was created uh, to save countries from uh, that decided to take uh, from the democratic roots, uh, and that's, that's an angle that uh, that must be won at the national level. However, there are many other member states where I believe that media freedom will be very helpful, and even in countries where media ownership, looking at Italy and the Berlusconi era, because Orban is not setting up a flavor by his own, Berlusconi was uh, his master at the beginning, at least, that he supported Orban's uh, attempts at the beginning, uh, helping some, with some ideas, how to capture uh, media and how to lessen external pluralism and internal pluralism at the media market. So focusing on, on media ownership transparency, I think this is a very important first step for many EU member states, including Hungary as well, and the, and the problematic uh, ones as well. 
uh, but we see that in Slovenia things has changed significantly since the new, new government took uh, took in power, and we assume that similar situation will happen to Poland as well. However, that will be we don't know what will happen to Slovakia. Um, uh, so there will be shifts here and there. So the mandatory transparency uh, for both state advertisement and media ownership, I think these are the, the mandatory first steps. Uh, these will not solve problems, but these will help for the public scrutiny to understand the system and the structure of the media services and to understand what sort of impact certain and government captures certain media outlets have. Uh, however, I'm saying that this is only a first step because I don't believe that the public would ever go into databases and search for minor details, who owns which company and what, what is cross-ownership. It also require, it requires a strong uh, ethics of journalism and independent journalism, as we heard in our previous panel. So without independent journalism, we can have transparency of media ownership, but if no one reports about it, then it's just uh, meaningless. So this is an important tool, but we still need strong journalism. Uh, so what happened is that at the Commission's version, media ownership transparency was totally meaningless. The Commission only required that some minor information would be posted on the on the websites of the of the media outlets and only certain specific news outlets only were covered. Uh, and then came in the European Parliament requiring a mandatory full transparency of, of media ownership, uh, not only focusing on news and current affair media, but any sort of media um, not focusing on the size of the media, which is, I believe, a very important step towards full transparency of media ownership. Um, also, both EU level and national level databases are required, which is a very important step uh, again, because if we have an EU level uh, database as well, that would also support to understand about the cross border ownership uh, issues. Uh, we know that in, in some countries there are like German uh, German publishers buy many uh, foreign uh, publisher houses and, and, and news outlets, so it's very important to understand the whole structure. Uh, however, there are certain issues still pending, and we really hope that during the trial when the Commission, the Council, and the European Parliament still fine-tuning the or not only fine-tuning, but they are aligning the different versions that they have, uh, we'll go even further. Because at the moment, uh, there are some uh, some issues and, and, and the problem is coming from the Court of Justice, basically, uh, which, which uh, basically shut down the beneficial ownership databases, which is preventing uh, um, investigative journalists to, to do their job properly. Uh, that was, a, if I have a little time to, to explain, so that was a, an oligarch uh, based in, in Luxembourg, owning uh, companies in British Virgin Island, owning uh, jet companies in Russia, so I don't think I have to go into details what sort of person can it be, who started a lawsuit uh, because his name appeared in the beneficial ownership database, revealing all his assets. Uh, and the Luxembourg Court referred the case to the European Court of Justice, and the European Court came with uh, came up with a decision last November saying that access to beneficial ownership database must be justified and could be limited. That, and they also annulled the fifth and, and the fourth anti money laundering directive. Sorry, the fifth, going back to the fourth and anti money uh, laundering directive. Namely, that journalists, whoever wants to have access to beneficial ownerships, must show their interest. So now we are in a situation that in many of the member states, they immediately shut down the beneficial ownership databases, starting with Luxembourg and Belgium, Austria, and so on and so forth. And even though the European Commission has established beforehand that media ownership database that was run by the Salzburg University, they decided to shut down their database because of the court ruling. The court ruling did not really mention anything related to media ownership. It was talking about uh, anti-money laundering databases, but it had a spillover effect. 
and this is very dangerous. And this is why we think that the, the, the regulation, the M farm must go further, ensuring that media ownership databases must be accessible fully to anyone without any sort of limitation, just to ensure that uh, when we balance privacy, as, as Oliver said, privacy against public interest, then in this case, media ownership is truly a, pub a public interest to get uh, information about. Uh, just quickly about the transparency about um, uh, the state advertising. Um, unfortunately, there was no mandate to touch up on state aid. It's a totally different uh, issue, even though in, in, in Hungary and in many uh, member states, it's not only state advertising that is used by government to finance government-friendly media outlets, but also other subsidies. Uh, if we, what well, Elda just mentioned about um, financing public service media, uh, it's a problem in Italy if public service media is not financed properly. In Hungary, uh, public service media spends billions of foreigns because it's a propaganda tool. So the problem is not that they don't get the financial resources. The question is the quality of the public service media that only serves as a governmental tool. And these are the minor tweaks and checks and balances that we need to ensure that even though we have an MFA and we have certain regulations, but in member states, my member states, we, have, we, we need different safeguards uh, because we don't have this one, one size fits all uh, solution, but as a first step, we, what we would really need is, is independent media authorities uh, all over uh, Europe. Uh, what happened to the state advertising, uh, also the European Parliament improved the text of the Commission significantly. There are very important and very good safeguards, starting with, with, with database, uh, mandatory database, both national level and also at the EU level. It's also very good that they um, um, lifted some limitation that would have been applicable to the size of the of, of the of, 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 of cities, uh, and also there are limitations on spending. So the, the tax uh, improved significantly, and we were very, very happy about it. Uh, there are still some issues like emergency spendings or exceptions. So there is a carve out for a certain period of time until the emergency period ends. In countries like Hungary, emergency. Uh, emergencies never end. The government just extends, 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 so the spending during those periods would not be reported. But these are really minor things, and in 26 other countries, it wouldn't be a problem. So overall, we are happy that the text improved significantly. However, I would say that in order to achieve uh, effective um, oversee of media pluralism and media freedom, we would work further to, to ensure that the text is even better uh, in a better shape than the turtle. But, uh, th thanks very much. I think in that you, you, you illustrate just how how complex European law can be in the different institutions involved. Just as you think you've made progress in one area, suddenly the you know a very powerful article like takes the case of European Court of Justice, and we discovered European Court of Justice not our bread. Um, which, 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 which complicates matters uh, enormously. I'm glad you also mentioned the, uh, the state aid, and I think it was another very significant element of the European Parliament's position on the state advertising is that it also included not just transparency about the amount of the funds that need to receive from, from the state, whether that's direct from government or from state aid companies uh, through advertising, but also state funds, not necessarily advertising funds, but state funds that, that go to companies that are part of the same business grouping as a media. So we're talking about, because that extends um, the, 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 the spotlight, as it were, to look at other more indirect ways that, that the state can fund the beneficial owner, whether or not the beneficial owner is or not, we can see where the funds are, are going. So yes, there are limits to what, what transparency you can do, but at least with transparency, we have to be quite we develop the evidence and the whole base of which we can then develop uh, further policy, um, perhaps at the national level.
actually have a look. Um, I, we're, we're running quickly through our hour and a half, so I want to now turn to um, uh, uh, um Amadori, who's uh, you know, a great student Italian journalist here, former president of the Venice uh, Journalist Association, former member of or, or, sorry, board member of the board of the journalists here. And uh, Janet, I mean, you've heard from you know, some of what we, we call ourselves experts on the, on the European Union of Freedom Map. It'd be really good to hear your, your response to that, how that would apply um, to the European context. Kind of, now, that might be about the use of state advertising, that might be about the concern about surveillance and Article 4. And also, we, we've heard about. Um, the problem of, of independent public, public service broadcasting. We know that obviously the last few months we've been um, uh, a, bit, uh, a bit of a crisis there as well. And I suppose the question is how will the EMFA um, be able to make a difference in, in Italy? But the floor is over to you. Hello? Yeah. Uh, you, you, you hear me? Yes. Hello. Good morning. Do you do you hear me? I have no. Hello. Hello. I can't hear any. You can hear me. Hello. You can you can hear me. I can hear you, but I, I don't know if you. you. You can hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, we can go. You, you can hear me? Oh, yeah. the, the audio <laughs> okay i don't i don't know why is there a speaker in the room Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so what we're going to do is move on to Dimitri while they're trying to sort out the, the, the speaker problem. Dimitri, you're also going to speak in Italian. You can have all the two minutes, everyone else can have all the two minutes. But if we do the microphone as well, so we should just hear it. I think more or less the same question to you, which you're, you're a working journalist. Um, how do you respond to the EMFA? Is this is going to make a difference, whether it's an Italian situation or the Greek situation, which you're also familiar with. Um, how, how will this help Germany? Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you for having me here. It's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be here. Io sono quello che non parla inglese. Eh? Allora, sì, eh, risponderò, sì, risponderò in, maniera, in maniera estremamente positiva, anzi entusiastica, entusiastica perché qui si parla di, di, di una possibilità di eh, in qualche maniera influenzare, regolare. Eh, la, le leggi sull'informazione di paesi che sono candidati verso l'Unione Europea e invece io vi parlerò del disastro informativo che c'è in un paese che è già membro dell'Unione Europea da parecchi anni, da parecchio tempo. Questo paese ovviamente è la Grecia, lo dico eh, immediatamente in due parole, a titolo è il paese senza informazioni. E comincerò con un breve accenno alle slide di cui si è parlato nel, nel panel di prima. Eh, parlandomi di una cara collega che si chiama Stafura Pulimeni, la quale è stato processo, eh, è stata condannata al primo, al primo processo perché in una, in una pagina web informativa di San Luco ha pubblicato che eh, 
eh, due esponenti, due dirigenti della società Hellenic Gold, che da tempo nella penisola calcinica stiamo facendo un lavoro di estrazione che è molto contestato dalla popolazione, eh, hanno violato le leggi del rispetto del, dell'ambiente, delle, eh, delle, dei monumenti archeologici che ci sono, eccetera, e sono stati condannati eh, in tribunale e ha pubblicato il nome dei due condannati. Uno dei due condannati, che lo cito, sperando che mi denunci anche in questione al Stato, Lianios, l'ha denunciata perché, ha, ha, perché ha, ha, ha pubblicato e lei è stata condannata in primo grado. E adesso siamo al, al secondo grado, al primo processo del secondo grado ha vinto, speriamo che venga anche al secondo. <ride> Sono le slap uh, greche, le ultime, perché non è più di moda, le slap greche non sono più, non più tanto di moda perché c'è stata una pioggia eh, contro una, cioè una, cioè una lista di, di chiese che si chiama uh, Costas uh, Axelanis, che è un caro amico, che mi sa che è studiantissimo, ne, ne, ne ha beccate otto, otto processi e ha vinto tutti. E quindi eh, come strumento è stato abbandonato eh, da parte e siamo passati agli assassini e alle aggressioni. Abbiamo avuto negli ultimi anni due giornalisti uccisi. Eh, uno era un giornalista, come voglio dire, in verità era un ricattatore e quindi l'hanno ucciso per la resa di conti interni nel mondo del crimine, il secondo invece è un giornalista vero, questo è un po' di eh, crimine organizzato e quindi ha eh, pagato purtroppo questo suo lavoro di inchiesta nel mondo del crimine organizzato nel greco. E abbiamo avuto più di recente, qualche settimana fa, due aggressioni, una sempre di Nico Svaxavanis perché è stato aggredito mentre passava la moglie e la suocera da uno uh, da un evasore fiscale che era, era ricordata la lista la card degli evasori fiscali lui l'aveva pubblicata l'aveva rivelata questa lista eh, il nome dell'aggressore era lì dentro l'evasore fiscale l'ha beccato e l'ha aggredito a pugni eh, l'altro aggredito è un giornalista meno simpatico a me un giornalista eh, non particolarmente simpatico a me, molto vicino al potere, diciamo, eh, che è anche stato anche lui, anche lui ha venduto uno stadio, uno stadio calcistico, da un imprenditore, diciamo così, eh, che si è sentito offeso da rivelazioni che ha fatto questo, questo giornalista, che non si sa bene esattamente di cosa riguardasse, eccetera, però è stato aggredito. E queste sono le aggressioni, diciamo, fatte da parte dei privati, sono le aggressioni fatte continuamente dalla polizia. Abbiamo avuto il, lo scontro dei treni molti mesi fa in Tessaglia con 57 morti e giornalisti picchiati, cameraman, fotografi, reporter, eccetera, perché stavano lì a fare il loro lavoro, a riprendere il disastro di due treni che sono scontrati, eccetera. Eh, altri fotoreporter, un fotoreporter che ha fatto, eh, stato premiato internazionalmente, ha fatto delle mostre anche in Italia, si chiama Nico Spilos, che è sotto processo perché è, ha fotografato il, lo sgombero di, dell'occupazione da parte della polizia e adesso è sotto processo per aggressione a poliziotti, resistenza alla forza pubblica, insulti, ingiurie, portava armi nucleari, non si sa bene di cos'altro non aveva. Sotto processo, perché stava lì a fotografare, era non che so scelto, stava lì per fare il lavoro suo, quando questi hanno attaccato e l'hanno messo sul processo. Questa è la situazione della Grecia. Adesso parliamo della disinformazione e così finisco la mia, la mia deposizione di dolore, sì, vi, vi garantisco, permettetemi questa, questa 
sotto la mia natura personale, diciamo così. E sono stato 30 anni corrispondente a Roma della televisione pubblica greca e adesso stare in un paese in cui non riesci a sapere cosa succede perché devi fare il reportage tu solo perché non c'è la possibilità di sapere che cosa effettivamente sta succedendo. Questa iniziativa europea in Grecia è ignota, non la conosce nessuno, non è mai arrivata. Io la mattina mi sveglio e mi leggo il giornale, ce l'ho qua in, bo in borsa, mi sono portato in aereo quando venivo, un giornale cooperativo, dei tre che, che circolano eh, di opposizione che esistono oggi in Grecia. Tre, tre giornali di opposizione in tutta la Grecia. I due sono organi di partito. E un altro giornale cooperativo che io compro e amo, leggo e sostengo anche questi colleghi per il giornale cooperativo. Nel decennio precedente, il decennio della crisi, ha distrutto la stampa greca e ha distrutto l'informazione greca perché tutte le televisioni private, tutte in mano a armatori, agli oligarchi che governano il paese, che sono la forza economica, quindi anche la forza politica del paese, hanno investito in televisioni private. E sono loro che controllano la mai l'informazione. Ma non è informazione, è propaganda governativa. Perché non sappiamo nulla di quello che succede fuori dal paese. Quest'estate la Grecia ha visto bruciare il 57% dei suoi imposti. Qual è la versione delle televisioni private? In traccia traccia quella che sta a portare con la Turchia e con la Bulgaria, che gli immigrati clandestini accendevano il fuoco per scaldarsi e allora ecco qua l'incendio, sono per colpa loro. Ovviamente in agosto, come tutti sapete, in Grecia fa freddissimo, bisogna scaldarsi in sera, perché, no? tutti vanno a fare sport invernali in Grecia ad agosto, si sa, no? La versione ufficiale era questa. Gli immigrati che passano il confine nella Turchia che accendevano il fuoco e quindi non è colpa del governo che si è bruciata il 57% dei boschi greci. Più tardi c'è stato un alluvione in Tessaglia, non so se lo sapete, non lo sapete perché non c'è informazione in Grecia, ma non c'è informazione anche fuori dalla Grecia sulla Grecia, perché come si fa ad avere? Come si fa? Si manda un corrispondente il quale che fa? Corre da un angolo all'altro? Non ha fonti locali? Non, non, può, non, 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 non può sapere quello che succede? Bene, c'è stata, eh, stata un'alluvione in cui si è scoperto che eh, il governo greco aveva preso da un pre una precedente alluvione, nello stesso, nella stessa tessaglia, però di dimensioni più ridotte, aveva preso non so quanti milioni dell'Unione Europea per fare il lavoro di, di sistemazione diciamo, delle correnti, quindi evitare, ma lui ci ha messo distinti per ragioni elettorali alle vittime della prima alluvione e quindi la seconda alluvione avremo un nuovo finanziamenti dell'Unione Europea saranno distribuiti alle persone. L'elemento che volevo dire e che ci riguarda è che il Parlamento Europeo è stato molto attento e molto severo nel tirare le orecchie al governo greco più volte. Alcune delle sue decisioni in inglese ce l'ho qua in borsa, eh, sul pluralismo, sul, in particolare sul problema del, del programma di spionaggio di Stona Predator, che si sa la scandalo ha studiato in Grecia ma ha assunto ormai c'è stata un'inchiesta di rapporto eh, del United eh, in Francia, in Italia l'ha pubblicata 
dopo anni, un giornale dopo anni, che partecipava all'inchiesta, ma si è scoperto che, eh, malgrado le assicurazioni da parte del governo greco, che lui li avrebbe sistemato, sì, li avrebbe pulito, avrebbe... non è successo assolutamente niente, e probabilmente in questo momento è probabile, non lo so, nel mio cellulare c'è cioè il Predator e in questo momento mi sta ascoltando qualcuno del, del governo greco. E non solo, la Grecia è un paese in cui non sono neanche loro questo, questo progetto, questo programma di, di spionaggio in Predator, ma viene anche esportato. L'inchiesta ha scoperto che è stato esportato in Madagascar, è stato esportato in Sudan, che come si vede non è un paese eh, che vive in Santa Pace, non è un paese anche questo in piena guerra e che è il responsabile di questa operazione di produzione e di distribuzione che è, che è il nipote del premio, che era responsabile per il segretario generale della presidenza del Consiglio, cioè il gruppo di mettere la situazione industriale con il, con il predator, non ha subito alcun tipo di eh, procedimenti legali. Tranquillo, libero, circola e fa tutte le cose. Questa è l'informazione di un paese membro dell'Unione Europea, criticato duramente e eh, eh, aspramente da parte dell'Unione Europea, ma pezzeggiato dalla Commissione Europea. Mi si permette di dirlo perché qua non sta eh, e, e da, da dove vengono continuamente. La, sulla realtà eh, passata l'estate alla villa di Mizzotaki Sacreta. E eh, non perde occasione di dire che, che la Grecia è il paese in cui il PIL aumenta, eccetera, eccetera. Sì, il PIL aumenta, ma non ci dice la bella tedesca che il debito pubblico della Grecia ammonta a 404,69 miliardi. Tanto la Grecia è andata messa, stata messa sotto pressione più di una decina d'anni fa erano molto di meno, non erano arrivati a 400 miliardi. Quindi l'Unione Europea fa benissimo a fare queste leggi. Sarà compito di noi giornalisti greci vedere la maniera, trovare la maniera intanto di far sapere che esistono, prima di cercare di vederle applicate ma anche la Commissione Europea ha le sue responsabilità perché se guardi solo il soldo è quello lì il risultato devi guardare anche come è la democrazia perché la questione dell'informazione non c'è bisogno che lo dica è una questione di democrazia il problema è che non esiste democrazia senza informazione infatti in Grecia noi viviamo in un ambiente estremamente oppressivo. Questo per la mia testimonianza. Grazie della vostra attenzione, scusatemi se vi ho afflitto, ma pensate a noi di che, di che, di che clima viviamo. Esatto. You also bring bring us down to earth. I mean, here we are talking about EU regulations moving towards justice, but the, the voice of the ordinary journalists on the ground who talks about violence, who talks about the murder of the Jews, the Karen Kapalaitas, who talks about um, the, the slaps, and we heard this extraordinary term from, from Serbia about a trick being sued for publishing evidence against the court. Here we have journalists being sued for naming. People who are subject to a court process simply publishing their name and, and winning those winning the, winning those cases. Earlier we talked about uh, the precarity of journalism. Uh, uh, we talked about but the fact that journalism is so hard to, to, to make any kind of money as a freelance journalism and, and the, the death of local journalism is also alluded to. So in that context, it's no surprise that actually journalism is recovered. Of the European Union of Freedom Act, and not a huge sufficiently big debate in the journalism community about what this means. We think that actually it would have a profound or could have a profound impact on journalism in the long run. We talked about the disinformation 
you the weak as a knight is there to try to short a as healthy as you deserve to possibly so that when you have disinformation channels, they are challenged because of the concentration of ownership and corruption in the media and the politics. The leaders of Mars is allowed to be migrant starting fires for a lack of enabling to spread because they are then. Um, I'm challenged, which really allows us to have your, um, your thoughts beyond that. Listen, I, I don't know what's happening with uh, Janine, I'm getting a shake of the head, so we're going to go on. We are almost time up. I'm, I'm going to... uh, but I'm, while you're deciding in your question, I want to go back to the question of surveillance, which you did bring up to the mission. This one go back to the last, and you didn't touch on that, I touched on this at the beginning. How in, in, in Greece? Would it make any difference to the presence of scandal? And, and, and what does that depend on the national not too much on national policy? First of all, of course, we have to distinguish. We have now different positions. We have the Commission, we have the Parliament, and we have the Council. Um, I would like to talk about the Parliament. Uh, position because that's the one even not perfect we prefer and we think there are a few safeguards that could help i think probably the most important one is the um, ex ante the need for an ex ante decision by the courts to be allowed to use spyware on very specific exemptions one is um the when it deals a uh, national crime for anybody who would be detained for at least five years to show this is a serious crime, it's not good enough for us. There are a few other um, exemptions on that. I think that's very important. Again, it means that the courts have to be independent. Again, it means it probably wouldn't help countries when you don't have independent courts. That, but that is also something at EU level we cannot say that for all. Um, but in general, and you would have to tell me how independent the courts in Greece are, um, it, it would it could be a safeguard. We all know when it comes to spyware how difficult it is to detect. We may all be spyware. We don't know. So it, it's it's a huge problem in any case. But it would set some safeguards. I just wanted to say that one word also to Hungary, which I agree, this law is not made for the sort of failed states, but well, it's, it's also to say that the states don't have any independent judicial anymore. It's, Hungary is not a failed state. It still has a civil society, and I think we have the best example here, but it has no independent justice. However, all will, uh, Sorry. However, Orban called this law an Orwellian law. So he must be a bit afraid of it, <laughs> which I found interesting. Um, I was a bit concerned when we had a meeting last year in Greece with some of your nice ministers, and they welcomed the Media Freedom Act, at least in, in the European Commission position. That made me a bit concerned how much influence it would indeed have on, on Greece. However, um, we cannot fix all what's happened. We said things have to be settled. <laughs> have to be settled in, in the old country. Some things have to be settled in Greece, but I still think that the law would help or would help us to use it better also in Greece. Thank you, Renata. I mean, I, I think if we learn the lesson, you're very cautious about um, these uh, like failed states. Because the next thing, if you don't, if you don't get a court case, you'll get sued by what I'm not going to call all the law. Um, and you may well get one from a uh, system next to you coming. Up. So at least we have that um, to, to fall back on and want to uh, set the record straight. Um, I'm looking again for hands. I see. Oh, we've got a hand. Fantastic. God, the season's about to last the present. Let me try. Sorry, there's a uh, one last try. I've got my question for me. We're going to buy it. Fine. Of course we can. Thank you. Sorry. You'll, you'll, be, you'll be ready next. So, John Luther, I do apologize. 
Mi sentite questa volta? You hear me? Okay, do you hear me now? Yes, no? Yeah, you can hear me? You can, you can hear me? I can hear you, but I don't know if you can hear me. Mi sentite? Il microfono io l'ho acceso. Quello nero, io l'ho attivato il microfono. Mi sentite? Non so quale sia il problema perché io il microfono l'ho acceso. Il mio microfono funziona. Just, just quickly for the interpreters to try to summarize this question about you've got European and European maps on the one hand, and the digital surface back on the other hand, the digital surface back to try to deal with like the disinformation by imposing certain rules or the lot of very large online platforms um, to, 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 to maintain standards on, uh, on those platforms when it comes to social media, whereas the Media Freedom Act there is an attempt, there's an exemption there for media. A slight interpreter of what your question was, but I think that's the direction of going in. But um, how would you make that respond? Uh, of course, there the is an, an exemption for media translators to uh, deal with these uh, two issues somehow and the increasing importance of uh, online platforms and in particular very large online platforms that somehow shape uh, through the recommended systems uh, to the uh, policies shape uh, to some extent, what uh, we uh, receive as uh, information. And uh, uh, on the other hand, the specific policy to protect uh, and support the media that uh, still are the basic, uh, are basic and fundamental for a uh, democracy as we have. Uh, known it so far really so if uh, um, media should be uh, supported uh, exactly uh, uh, indeed uh, the, the policy on media is a specific one and somehow is a special treatment vis a vis what uh, uh, is uh, currently foreseen under the Digital Services Act, uh, that uh, uh, instead, for instance, in Article 34 and 35, uh, uh, asks uh, 
the platform to uh, put in place uh, all the um, duties of care, uh, so risk assessment and risk mitigation in order to limit uh, the spread, uh, for instance, among many other things, the spread of this information online based on, uh, uh, on the fact that uh, they are um, those that uh, in, in this new media environment, this new information environment uh, are uh, the most influential probably, in particular the younger generations. So, um, uh, yes, indeed, uh, there is uh, uh, an attempt to uh, limit the damages from disinformation and uh, uh, boost uh, somehow the an healthy media environment, as was uh, uh, said before. Um, I don't know if we want to enter into the discussion of Article 17. But I mean, let's put it out there. I mean, are there any, are there any further questions? Oh, just to say, we've gone past the hour, but I'm, I'm more than happy to extend this with, with 10 or 15 minutes, partly because we, we start this. And I understand that, that, that that's, that, that's okay. So, is there any, is there a couple more, is there, is there any time for other questions out there? Okay. If not, then I'll allow Elder to explore the uh, article 17 a bit further. Okay. Yeah, I just want to be accurate to, to the question uh, now about Article 17. But my understanding is that one of the main reasons of uh, introducing this piece of legislation is to rebalance the financial situation of media outlets uh, and helping to get the stable uh, financing background, whether it be public service media or other media outlets. In comparison to very large online platforms that are taking the resources from the media. And the solution that was taken by the Commission is indeed a bit different approach than it was seen in under the Digital Services Act, because in the European Media Freedom Act, basically they just focus on a very conservative understanding of the media. Because there are certain topics that media is usually reluctant to report about, like environmental issues. In many cases, there are NGOs which are reporting about it, as slaps are also used against NGOs and not media outlets. And the European Media Freedom Act is only focusing on media and creates, in certain articles, um, a privileged treatment for media and not to any sort of sources of, of information. So in that sense, yes, while Digital Services Act is a horizontal piece of legislation, the European Media Freedom Act is focusing on the classic media outlets and trying to rebalance this financial problem and also some copyright problems as well. And uh, my understanding that it could create a problem in the long run and also in the short run, because in especially in countries where there is not a strong uh, journalist associations and self-regulatory mechanisms, uh, it could lead to a situation where national authorities would decide which is a media outlet and which is not a media outlet, which would have a privilege and in the long run it can end up in who decides who can enter a press um, uh, a press conference and who is not? So there is room for misusing Media Freedom Act, but this is something that we cannot avoid, of course. But the, my understanding to your question is that the different approach is coming from the the purpose of the of the Media Freedom Act and the digital service that it can be working. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm going to ask just two more questions. I'm going to put it out there, and any member of the panel uh, can respond to them. First, I do want to come back to this question about our. Yeah, I'm going to ask if it's a good job with the um, issue of security or tenure for those who are put into management of the boards if they are not. Uh, a new government can not um, uh, be elected into power and then change the management and then change the entire editorial line um, of the board. 
We know that you know, we did some in, I think back in May the, the CEO of the line was Dorotez was here to resign. Um, and then we can wait by this appointment of the questionnaire and we'll the time that made a difference. Just on the back of that, um, so, so the month of so, uh, last month at the um, in Slovakia, uh, the elections took place. So we're expecting a new government's performance there. And it's, it's been said that the cultural position, cultural issue, will go to the far right party um, in Slovakia. And there are rumors that they would, that they are also planning to immediately split the public railing and TV to two separate companies so that they can then close. Uh, uh, a whole, whole set of new management to their own people uh, into, uh, into management positions. Yeah, right. so, so that was one question. And the second question, it's in fact time to take along to the question, we talked also about the uh, European board as a worldwide regulator. There's a question about how to guarantee the independence of that board, both vis-a-vis -vis European Commission, but also vis-a-vis -vis its own members when you have a number of national regulators that have already been if you like politically captured in the sense that they have political appointees put in place. How do we protect the European board from its own uh, from uh, protecting the best European board from the politically captured national regulators that would be represented on that board? So there's two, two questions that I might like to and please feel free to choose what or that just have a final final comment before lunch. Uh, so, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, Article 5 and uh, the case of the uh, to be honest, uh, uh, Article 5 uh, uh, sets uh, very good and uh, broad uh, standards uh, business as well. What we ask in this pluralist monitor in order to collect the information on how uh, the public service media uh, will function, how are uh, regulated. Um, uh, of course, this is a regulation. If it becomes a regulation, it will be enforced in the uh, infringement procedure. Uh, this uh, this rule specifically is uh, in the in quite uh, broad and uh, uh, of course could be applied, um, but I don't know if uh, the Italian case is really fit uh, fitting this uh, this article, uh, just because uh, of course we need. Uh, um, the uh, the willingness to uh, and resist that somehow from those that are appointed in this uh, uh, in this uh, box and uh, to use the rules that they have in order to uh, uphold their independence. Uh, yes, it should be used. Uh, of course, we have to choose also the people that want to be independent. Okay. Yeah, uh, you're more skeptical on that than I am. I have to say the Article 5, as it stands now in the UK Parliament, I think would not be better. I think it's very good. It gives many safeguards. It only talks about an independent body um, that is set aside. But as we have, of course, with everything which is written in the EFA, national implementation, national enforcement is paramount. And for that, we need independent organization to enforce it. And there you rightly say, you need that. You need it from, the, from anybody, from the unions, from, uh, from, from other organizations you need. And there we come to the second question, an independent board, um, because without the, the, the help of the independent board, it would be more difficult. Um, this is a challenge we have throughout Europe, um, but still we are fighting for it. We are fighting for it also together with the EU, because you've been broadcasting union, which is the, the conglomerate of all public service media. These are their members, but they have nothing to say. 
this is the problem. They sometimes come to us when we have an alert and there is no independence to the Council of Europe. We do it for them. But they have problems to do it themselves. For them, this would be utterly important and useful. So that's why we have fought for, for strengthening um, of, of this input on the end um, But yes, of course, we have to see more. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so just one uh, reference to Slovenia. So uh, if there is a law to keep people in position and there is a change into a more democratic new regime and they want to get rid of people who are influenced by the former government, that I mean they needed uh, you know, circle and the whole law to restore the situation. And this is what Poland is facing at the moment. Um, but still, I mean, this is again, you know, there is no one size fits all rule. So there, there are solutions that are offering more safeguards. Uh, and I, I also agree that our five of that sense is great. Um, uh, yeah, regarding the national, I think this is a missed opportunity on behalf of. Uh, I mean, all, all of the, the EU legislative bodies that strengthening the national uh, media authorities is, is a missed vote. It, it doesn't seem, even though they realize it's coming from many, many reports that in many members of this problem, if we don't have national level independence, then the board, it's a question how we will operate similarly to the GDPR enforcement to the European Board of um, Data Protection Board. Uh, situation if there is a strong leadership and there is enough member states who, who offer independent uh, people delegated to the board, then it could work properly. Otherwise, it's a question and it's an over politicized situation. So it's, it's similar to the infringement procedures in the Commission that there are many open, they are reluctant to, to start, and there are pending cases. So hopefully, civil society and academia can push it further when we get to the I'm not thinking one of the messages there is that once the EMFA is done, the work is done, it's actually not finished. In fact, it's just the beginning. It's implementation and inclusion. Dimitri, are you slightly more optimistic this might make a difference with the journalists and Reese? I'm in the lens. Okay. Well, we do have some reasons to be optimistic. If, if the elections in Poland be taken out of the that is that an end of the Riferiti alla all'Unione Europea, all'intervento dell'Unione Europea, sì, sì, cioè l'intervento dell'Unione Europea fa essere ottimista, sì, è questa la risposta, sì, non avevo capito, non avevo capito la domanda, sì, meno, sì, 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 no, non avevo capito la domanda. Non lo faccio per, per dargli le risposte che lui vuole sentire, lo faccio perché per me non avevo capito la domanda. Vai. I, 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 just want, I just want to make sure that you didn't think that our work was done in vain. That, that it might, it might somehow make a And the Gunners have perhaps some comments in the vote on the vote in the election. Um, so, but, and, and before that, I mean, Ava, Ava said that the, she contradicted me and said that the Community Group Act is not designed to cope with the Pun Group. And, and she's right, because of course it's sort of 10 years too late, but it wasn't designed to cope with what Hunger would have been like 10 years ago. And actually, the model that it presents, all those elements that we capture, that they're all really intense throughout the EMFA to address all of them. And Poland is an example where you have partial media capture. It survived the efforts of peace to, to, to repeat or to build some Hungarian equivalent, and largely because of the size of the market, largely because um, media there were, were owned, yes, both by foreign investors and by substant, you know, substantial uh, uh, Polish companies who had the resilience not to fall into the, um, not to be economically squeezed into the propaganda camp. And so, 
mini food in that cup, and we have that with different skin, there's a whole number of nutrients with partial mini captions. Um, where this can this can give a real boost to those working at the national level to to the help help roll that back. It doesn't have to be left some phone, but it does give us cause for hope and call to continue the the, the struggle that we that we're really here for. Um, thank you, everybody. Apologies for holding you back in your lunch. Uh, but let's go. <laughs>